Hello and welcome back. My name is Patrick Boyle and this is class number six of uh, Applied Portfolio Management. And in today's class, we're going to be learning all about alternative investments. So firstly, I guess I should explain what alternative investments are. Well, alternative investments are investments other than traditional investments like stocks and bonds. Um, so they include things like private equity, venture capital, commodities, hedge funds, property investments, that sort of thing. So they're additional investments that are available to investors outside of the sort of traditional asset classes that most people think of, which are stocks and bonds. And so let's have a quick look at sort of the size of the world of alternative investments. So this is a chart of the average allocation of 62 university endowments. So university, uh, American university endowments. So big American universities usually have an endowment fund that they're able to invest in one way or another. And if we take a quick look at how they allocate their, their capital, we can then sort of see um, how big the, the various asset classes are amongst institutional investors. So up here we've got about a 44.9, so we'll call that a 45% allocation to equities. Uh, we've got about a 12.5% allocation to fixed income, which means bonds. Then we've got about 22.4% allocated to hedge funds, 4.4% in real estate, 3.5% in venture capital, 5.9% in private equity, 1.7% in cash, and 4.2% in natural resources. So that's the breakdown of the typical US endowment fund. So you can see in this uh, case that actually, um, you know, maybe about one third of the assets are devoted to alternative investments. Now, is that necessarily a sensible uh, asset allocation? I'll leave that up to you guys to decide. But, um, you know, the typical investor obviously would not have really anything in alternative investments or a very small amount. And it depends if you're going to, I wouldn't fully include, you know, technically people include property in that. I wouldn't really. If you include property investments in, in alternatives, well, then people actually have quite a lot allocated to that. But um, outside of equities and fixed income, as you can see, uh, hedge funds, venture capital and private equity do seem to make up a, a fairly large share. So in today's class, we're going to be learning all about private equity. So that's the breakdown. There's sort of this class and two more remaining. In this class, we'll learn all about private equity or the different types of private equity. And then in the next two classes, we'll learn all about hedge fund strategies and how people invest in, in that world. So Let's get going. Um, I should point out that an awful lot of this class is based upon um, my book written with Jesse McDougall called Corporate Finance. Um, and there's a link to that below. Um, I'll, I'll actually, I'm talking through quite a lot of books in, in this class, so I'll probably have a few links below. If there's a book I mentioned that you think might be interesting, uh, you know, you can probably find it below. Anyhow, so private equity, what is it? Well, Private equity is an alternative asset class, and it usually basically means private financing for companies. So instead of companies issuing public equity or issuing bonds, they go to a wealthy person or usually in this day and age, a private equity firm, which is a fund that's invested in by these wealthy people, and, uh, and they arrange private financing. Now that private financing can be debt or equity. Um, usually private equity is made up of funds and investors that directly invest in private companies. So essentially a lot of the idea behind this, it's kind of an interesting thing that has happened, I guess, over the last couple of decades really, in that there are less and less public firms. So it used to be that there were small companies that were invested in maybe by venture capital or by kind of friends and families and they'd reach a certain scale and then they'd need more capital and they'd do an IPO in order to raise that capital and then they would grow the business from that point onwards. Well, nowadays it seems 
that an, a lot more firms are staying private rather than going public. And in addition, um, an awful lot of public companies are becoming private. They're getting bought out in leverage buyouts or management buyouts or whatever it might be. And so the world has changed quite a bit in recent years. And we'll, we'll talk about that more as we go on. And so essentially, institutional and wealthy investors provide the capital for, for private equity. So they often invest in a private equity fund and that fund then is invested in a bunch of these kinds of deals. Um, the capital can be used to fund new technology, make acquisitions, expand working capital and to bolster and solidify a balance sheet. So there's many uses of the capital uh, that uh, is put into these companies through private equity investments. So let's have a quick look here at deal values. And so this is just a breakdown. I believe this came from Bain and Company. And this is a breakdown of the various deal sizes over time. So we've got 2005, 2006, all the way through to 2019. So this is a fairly up-to-date breakdown. And so as you can see, the deal values were very large in 06 and 07, right before the credit crunch. Then an awful lot of, uh, you know, people stopped investing in a lot of this sort of stuff. And it has gradually grown and we're back uh, in 2018 and 19. We're at, you know, a fairly large deal size overall. Um, the breakdown in there is between the, the darkest color is North America, then we go to Europe, uh, then Asia Pacific and the rest of the world. So you can kind of see quite a bit of growth in Europe um, and also in Asia Pacific over the last decade in, in, uh, in, in the types of deals that are being done. So as you can see, this is something that has grown quite a lot in terms of, of deal value. And of course, we'll have to see how this goes going forward because uh, right now we're in the middle of the whole uh, coronavirus um, lockdown and markets have fallen quite a little bit. And so we'll, uh, we'll be interested to see how this affects uh, private equity over time. So if you're, if you're watching this later, you know, do, uh, do Google it and see what happened. Uh, but for us right now, we just have to, uh, you know, speculate, I guess. So that is deal values over time. So I guess we can break private equity down into three basic categories. That's what most people do is they say, well, we can break private equity into venture capital, growth capital, and then LBOs and MBOs. LBO stands for leverage buyout, MBO stands for management buyout. And so we've got these three different categories. And so I'll, I'll break them down. We'll talk about each category separately during today's class. So we'll start out with venture capital. Uh, we'll start out with the smallest companies, I guess. And um, venture capital is private equity financing to start up businesses. So this is kind of a lot of what you'll hear about in Silicon Valley and things like that. This is the idea of uh, private equity investors. People put their money together into a fund and they use it to invest in early stage and emerging companies with high growth potential. Now, obviously the start up companies they're probably a bit exciting uh, they're also probably quite risky okay and so the kind of investments that are being made in this space they're sort of companies that can either do awfully well or go to zero um, actually one book that i will recommend in the description below is a book called zero to one by peter thiel um, he is uh, i think one of the ebay founders went on to be the first investor in facebook and uh, he, he wrote this book called zero to one i think i have it coming up in a slide in a minute um, but it's it's probably i think the best book that i have read on the topic of venture capital and in fact i would argue that it's one of the better business books that I've read at all. And so it's kind of really high on my recommended list of books if you're looking for something to read in this space. And so anyhow, the idea of venture capital is to invest in these early stage companies. Uh, usually it's an equity stake that they take, right? Because, you know, if you think about it, a lot of these companies are like a technology growth company. They might require an awful lot of capital. We'll say a Facebook type company has years of spending money before any revenues come in at all. 
And so a company like that would be entirely unsuited to, to debt. And actually, that's kind of where venture capital fits in. If you think about it, a, a traditional company might, you know, the, the uh, person who starts up, the founder of the company, probably puts in some of their savings and they start a company. And then what would happen next is usually as it grows a little bit, they might either ask friends or family or they might just get a bank loan, right? And so if you start at a restaurant, you might spend some money, get a bank loan, get things going, and then you're able to pay off the bank loan with the revenues that come in. Now, for a lot of other types of company, in particular in this kind of high tech space where it might be very expensive to start up and revenues don't come for a while, an equity stake is really what's needed. A debt, debt is not suitable for a company like that. So, um, there will usually be an, an equity or an ownership stake. These are companies with a high failure rate. And that's actually one of the things that's interesting in Peter Thiel's book is he talks about how high a return expectation you have to have uh, when you're a venture capital investor. And the reason is that if you recognize, well, say if you put 10 companies into your, your pool of, uh, in, into your fund, the problem is that if three of them are gonna go to zero, maybe even five of them will go to zero, the ones that survive and that do well, you have to really expect them to do awfully well, you know, because if they just have an average or an acceptable return, the overall pool's return is quite bad because of the failures in there. Um, so usually uh, venture capital looks to invest in innovative industries. So we're looking at things like the IT business, you know, the whole Silicon Valley thing, uh, often areas like clean tech or biotech. So they're often sort of te high tech businesses that require quite a bit of startup capital in order to, uh, to be ready to uh, take to market. Um, so that is what venture capital is. The next uh, section we'll look at is growth capital. And growth capital is sort of in between uh, the LBO and the venture capital stage. So it often involves a minority stake in more mature companies. So these will be companies that are up and running, usually probably generating uh, revenues and maybe profits. And they're looking for capital either to expand, to restructure, or to enter new markets, or maybe even to finance and acquisition. So these are existing companies that are doing okay, but they need more capital and they would turn to a private equity growth capital company uh, in order to look for financing. So now in this case, uh, you'll often see the investment structured as some sort of a hybrid security like a, a preferred stock or a, um, or a convertible bond of some sort. It's usually a hybrid security that involves some ownership stake. So often this is quite a structured investment. This won't just be, here's some equity or here's a loan. It'll be some sort of senior secured uh, investment. And so um, a friend of mine uh, has pointed out that the way these deals are structured is often that it's a minority investment in that they don't own a huge stake in the company, but they might have majority control. And so they're essentially putting money in, they'll have a special deal uh, that, that is, you know, one of these special securities that has been usually made just for them. And it, uh, it gives them a payoff that is different to the owners of the company and different to lenders to the company, if any exist. And, uh, you know, often the type of company that will do this once again is one that is not well suited to borrow additional debt, you know, because usually a company would rather just go to a bank for a loan rather than, uh, you know, issue a security like this. And, uh, and the reason that they, they uh, go to these type of investors is that they possibly already have enough debt or they're in a volatile enough business that banks don't typically like lending to them. And so uh, that is growth capital and we'll learn more about that in a moment. And then the final group that we talked about is leveraged buyouts. And a leveraged buyout, as the name suggests, it involves leverage, which means borrowing in finance. And it involves the acquisition of a company using a significant amount of borrowed money. So usually a leveraged buyout involves using debt 
to buy a company. And so the private equity company will own the equity stake and they'll approach various lenders in order to get uh, an, an amount of debt that they can lever it up and afford to buy this company. Um, the target's cash flow is usually the collateral that's used to secure the borrowed money. So essentially they buy the, the company out and then use the cash flow in order to increase the leverage on the company. The use of debt usually has a lower cost of capital than equity, and therefore that will reduce the overall cost of financing the, the acquisition. So you might take a company, well, the, the traditional idea is that there might be a company that has no debt at all or very little debt, and you essentially just buy it out change the capital structure so there's way more debt. You might go from, we'll say the average, uh, you know, mid cap, uh, small cap company might have a debt of around 35% and a, a private equity firm might buy that out, lever it up to have a debt of about 75% of the capital structure. And then because of the advantages of debt over equity in terms of financing, because of the lower cost of capital, you end up uh, with a higher return to equity. Now, of course, the nature of that, like it's not a risk-free return by any means. You know, you're increasing the risk of a company by levering it more. And so you do get a higher return on your equity, but of course it's because it's riskier than it was before. Um, so what have we got next? And then finally, management buyouts, which is sort of a subset of leveraged buyouts. And this is a, a type of leverage buyout where the management by a large part are, are all of the company from the existing owners. So um, this, the main difference between this and the leveraged buyout, because in many ways you could say, well, it's just a leveraged buyout. And it kind of is. The difference is that there's maybe some conflicts of interest in here. So we have to think about those. So the management of the company might have an informational edge. If you think about it, the management are running the company even though someone else owns it. And so the management might actually have sort of, ins well, they should have inside information as to how good a prospect the company is. And so the question is, do they have an unfair advantage over the current owners when they're negotiating this deal? Um, usually this, like although it's called a management buyout, it usually the management can't come up with all of the capital themselves to buy out the company. And so usually it involves having a private equity company there as a sponsor to put up some of the equity stake that will be involved. But like I said, an MBO and an LBO, very similar deals. So private equity overall, I, I possibly should have explained this first, but you know, I do what I can. Um, so some of the operations of private equity firms might involve buying out companies that are struggling and turning them around. And historically, that's often how people have thought about private equity is sort of turn around companies. But in truth, in the real world, they don't really do that. Now, they, they sometimes do. And I think I mentioned in a prior class the example of the of Olive Garden, you know, where I think it was more of an activist investor where they, they really came in and criticized like everything down to the recipes used by, uh, by Olive Garden and so on. They said they weren't using enough salt and all of these things, you know. Um, but, uh, you know, in, it, with this sort of thing, I'm not sure that they usually turn around a company. Like they don't find a company that's struggling and say, oh, we can manage this better. I mean, they, they might do that. Some firms might do that. But often it's really just about changing the capital structure or the, the fact that the private equity firm has really good access to capital markets is useful for these companies because essentially maybe the main problem that the company is having is a lack of access to capital and a private equity company is maybe able to help them out with that. And so, and also then things like just changing the capital structure, levering it up, that sort of thing will affect returns. Um, one of the other advantages that a, a private equity company has is usually they tie up the capital for a very long time. So we'll say for a hedge fund or a mutual fund or any, any kind of typical 
capital investor, uh, the capital they have, they might have uh, a sort of temporary capital. If they're doing well, maybe they'll get more. If they're not doing well, it'll get redeemed. With private equity, it's usually locked up maybe for 10 years or more. And so in a way, the private equity investors get to take a long-term view. They get to invest their money and they don't really have to deal that much with the investors until it's time to liquidate the portfolio or until they're trying to raise an additional fund maybe from the same investors. But so that is, that's the idea. Now, in terms of how they exit, you know, traditionally people think of it as that they exit through IPOing the company, you know, that they have this private company, they build it up to a certain extent and then IPO it. More and more we're seeing that it's usually just M&A activity that gets them out. We'll talk later about how they get out of these deals, but IPOs are actually becoming smaller and smaller. Often they even just sell to another private equity company. So, um, Let's go back and we'll walk through now venture capital in a bit more detail. So, as I said earlier, different types of businesses seek different types of investor. And it's actually important for a business to have the right kind of investor because then, uh, then their interests are maybe better aligned and they understand each other better. And so things like tech companies that might have huge startup costs and not bring in any revenues for a while might, as I said earlier, never be able to really raise debt in the early stages. And so they have to go to venture capital. And so Facebook uh, was entirely VC funded from its launch in 2004 until it went public in 2012. Uh, they started out with $500,000 in funding from Peter Thiel uh, and ended up raising over $1.3 billion in venture capital funding before they went public. So they, you know, and that, that sort of, um, there's a term that, that's used in, in the press a lot now. They refer to companies as unicorns or often tech unicorns. And a unicorn is a company that is a private company, usually funded by venture capital, that is worth over a billion dollars. And they were called unicorns. The, the idea was that they're rare because, as I'm sure you guys know, it's very rare to see an actual unicorn. Uh, usually it's just a horse. But, um, but uh, you know, nowadays there's more and more of these unicorns. And, uh, of course, then they're not necessarily all doing as well. The, the big example being Theranos, the uh, blood testing company uh, founded by Elizabeth Holmes. And if you haven't, if you don't know that story, it's worth Googling it. It's an interesting story. But anyhow, so we'll move on. Um, so... As Peter Thiel tells you in this book, Zero to One, which I highly recommend, uh, these investments do have a low success rate, right? So when people invest in, when these venture capital investors make an investment, they are aware that all of their deals will not work out. So, you know, the, you might imagine that a, a regular equity investor hopes to invest in a diversified portfolio and they kind of hope that most of their companies will still be around in a few years time. While in venture capital, they know that this it may well not be the case. Uh, so they're high risk investments, many of them going to zero. And so some of them really have to hit the ball out of the park. You know, you have to have some companies that do amazingly well to compensate you for the losses on the others. A bit of an interesting thing on that, you know, I've been looking a lot at private equity returns in order to put this class together. And interestingly enough, you do see a certain amount of serial correlation in the returns of venture capital funds. Now it's worth noting with all of these private equity funds, usually what they do is they raise a certain amount of money for a fund, they invest that, it might take them a few years to find the companies to invest in and then so a few years later when they've got the first fund fully invested, they'll go out and they'll raise another fund to invest. And in the venture capital space, you actually do see that prior successes are predictive of future successes. Now, a lot of the, in particular in Silicon Valley, a lot of VC funds are actually run by uh, successful founders, you know, people like Peter Thiel or Mark Andreessen and things like that. And so, um, you know, and they seem to, be in the network and have a good sense of what might work and what might not work. Um, you don't really see that in the rest of private equity. You know, a lot of um, investors tend to invest in whenever, if, if the first uh, private equity fund performed well, the investors will usually invest in the second and maybe even the third fund launched by that company. But 
that's typically not necessarily that smart. Usually there's nothing really predictive about an early success in regular private equity, like in LBOs and that sort of thing, while there does appear to be in venture capital. So that's a little bit interesting. Now, we look here at uh, venture capital returns. Um, this is, I believe, from Cambridge Associates. Um, and so this is the Cambridge Associates uh, US Venture Capital Index. And the returns, unfortunately, they're not quite as exciting as you might hope, you know. We've got the 10-year return is around 10.22%, which is slightly behind the 10.78% return of the Dow Jones Index. Um, and then we've got the 20-year return of 21.7%, and the Dow Jones uh, returned over that period 7.6%. So actually quite a good long-term return, but maybe not such a good uh, medium-term return. Uh, uh, or shortish term return. And in the very long term, uh, you know, the 30 year return, you've got returns of 11.21% for the Dow Jones and 19.65 for, for the, uh, the Cambridge uh, Associates Venture Capital Index. So I guess one of the questions we have to ask is, are returns going to be as good in the future as they were in the past? Clearly, they, they've fallen or they're not as good as they used to be, but that could just be, uh, you know, the recent 10 years. We'll have to see. Um, but, you know, it is it is also a high risk investment usually. So you you should expect a, a higher return. OK, so now we'll move on to growth capital, the next type of private equity company we'll talk about or the type of investment they make. And, um, and growth capital is often to finance a transformational event in the life cycle of a company. So as I said earlier, these are companies that are up and running. They've usually got, uh, you know, positive returns. They're, they're uh, you know, um, profitable hopefully or definitely bringing in revenues and they've gone to a private equity company looking for growth capital for additional capital in order to improve their business. Um, they're usually more mature companies than venture capital. They're usually generating revenue and profit but need cash to fund either expansions, acquisitions or other investments. These are structured quite differently. So usually there'll be a preferred equity stake or hybrid securities that include some sort of contractual return that, that um, I'll talk more about that in a moment, but the contractual return might just even be, uh, you know, coupons on a bond. But sometimes they even say, if we're putting in a million dollars, we require uh, 1.1 million on return if you close out this investment in the next 10 years. Now, that means, of course, if the investment goes sideways or even down a little bit, that they might exit with their 1.1 times return while the founders of the company have to actually pay them uh, to exit, you know. So these are, you know, really quite different deals to, uh, to venture capital and also quite different to leverage buyouts. Often they're not good candidates for additional debt. Like that's, I've said this earlier, that's why they're doing this is they're often not good candidates for additional debt. Um, often just due to unstable earnings because we'll see, you know, debt investors love very stable earnings. Uh, equally, LBO investors love stable earnings. They essentially like boring companies that are just sort of generating cash flow. Um, this type of company, maybe if it's in a cyclical industry or something like that, debt investors don't like that because they worry that the cycle might turn and uh, you know LBO investors don't like that because they like to really lever up the investment and so um, that is growth capital so often the company will be founder owned so it might be a business that was started up by an individual and they still own their stake they, they might own the whole company and they've gone to one of these firms for uh, for investment often there might never have been any institutional investors before, so it's just privately held. Sometimes the reason that they're even interested in dealing with, with these guys or, or, or the reason the, the growth capital investors turn up is they realize that this might be sort of a solid business that's been around for a while, um, but the founder is, uh, we'll say, getting older, doesn't have children who want to run the firm, and it's almost a way of selling on the firm as well. There, there's a few ways that this kind of deal might be structured. 
usually there's way less leverage in this or, or often no leverage compared to leverage buyouts and that's just because the investment itself is already risky right so with a leverage buyout it's usually kind of a, a boring low risk company that you lever up quite a lot with this it might um you might already have uh you know a, a reasonable level of volatility so you don't want to lever it or they might already have debt and so usually in this space the the returns that the investors get are actually due to the growth of the business they're due to the business doing well rather than it being a boring business that's roughly the same before and after but you've just gone from 35 percent leverage to 75 percent leverage the term sheets in this space are all different i've found uh you know i've seen a few of them i've never really seen two the same you know they they they, they can be similar to each other but essentially these investors try to structure their own type of deal that appeals to them and it's negotiable you know they speak with the uh, with, with the owners of the company and they try and work out a deal that works for both of them and so often they'll they'll pitch uh, you know in truth often a rather unattractive uh, deal sheet and the the owner of the company will push back and say well no I, I can't take uh, money on that those terms how about if we relax this that and the other about your term sheet and then we'll be able to do something so that is um, growth capital within the world of private equity um, I'll give you a quick example of this because actually Warren Buffett through Berkshire Hathaway, although that's not a private equity firm, he does a lot of private equity type transactions where he makes direct investments into firms, either buying them out in whole or, um, or, or just an investment. And often, you know, one, one of the benefits he has is simply that people come to him like he's a famous investor. It's sort of good for a company to be able to state that Warren Buffett is a, a shareholder because it signals to the world that maybe it's a good, a good investment and a good company. But often uh, Warren Buffett will structure his investments a little bit like these sort of growth equity deals. So I have here an example from 2009 when Warren Buffett put $5 billion into Goldman Sachs. Now, this was towards the end of the credit crunch. A lot of people didn't really want to invest in banks. The banks were kind of on the ropes, you know. And so Warren Buffett agreed to do this deal, but instead of just buying, you know, he could have bought $5 billion worth of shares out there. That would have pushed up the stock price. It's not really any additional capital for, for Goldman. Goldman needed capital. And so he put 5 billion in, which would have bought him 50 million shares. That's what you would have gotten if you had bought $5 billion uh, worth of Goldman Sachs back then. But instead, what he negotiated was 50 million preferred shares with a 10% dividend, right? So the regular Goldman Sachs uh, shares were not paying a dividend like this. Warren Buffett shares were paying that dividend. Included in the package were 43 million warrants with a strike of 115. And so a warrant is a little bit like a call option. And if you don't know what a warrant is, I do have a, a video on YouTube that you can uh, look at and it'll tell you what a warrant is. So instead of just getting 50 million shares, he got 50 million preferred shares with this 10% dividend, which is a pretty good return, um, and 43 million warrants, which are kind of like call options. So he's uh, really levered into the growth of the equity of Goldman Sachs. So how did it work out for him? Well, two years later, Goldman Sachs bought him out of this deal. So they bought back the preferred shares for 5.64 billion, right? So he had put in five and he got 5.64 back. So that's 0.64 billion better uh, that are more than he had to start with. He also received two 10% coupon payments, right? So that's on top of what, what they paid him back. And then the warrants he exercised at 190 a share, making an additional profit of 3.225 billion. So as you can see, this turned out to be a very good deal for Warren Buffett. And, and part of the deal, you know, maybe he, he would have done all right had he just bought the equity, I suppose. But, you know, he kind of set up quite a good deal for himself here. And for example, if, if Goldman Sachs hadn't done that well, he would have been 
senior in the capital structure to the regular investors who, who would have owned common equity because pre preferred shares are senior. He would have been getting the cash flow, the 10% a year uh, associated with the dividends. And he would have, of course, owned these warrants that he could have exercised at some point in the future. So there's, there's many ways that this deal is a better deal than just putting your money straight into to the stock. Now, of course, the world get, didn't get offered this security. Warren Buffett got offered this. And equally, some of the big private equity companies could probably go out and pitch this kind of deal to, to companies who need capital. But uh, you know, part of it is that you have to be the kind of person who can put five billion in rather than the kind of person who, you know, who, who can invest a small amount of money. So it's one big investor, uh, in particular, you know, what Warren Buffett lent to Goldman Sachs in addition to, to him uh, investing is he lent the sort of credibility associated with his good name. And when that came out in the press the next day that the deal had been done, Goldman Sachs share price popped right away. Firstly, because they were no longer undercapitalized. And secondly, because they had a very respectable investor involved with them. So uh, that's that's growth capital, and that's the type of investments that maybe that type of, of uh, private equity firm might do. The next thing we're going to talk about here is leveraged buyouts. And this is by far, I would say, the biggest space in, in private equity. And so how this works is a private equity uh, firm, which is often referred to as a financial sponsor. You'll often see in text they refer to sponsors. That's the private equity firm. Uh, buys companies using a small amount of equity and a large amount of debt. So they just put up a small amount of money, they borrow an awful lot more money, and then they own the company. And then they are able to receive a leveraged return on equity. Um, often they're buying mature firms. And in fact, I would say this is really almost always the case because essentially the type of um, the type of firms they look to invest in are often very steady, non-cyclical firms that just, you know, create sort of steady cash flows. And that way you're able to lever it up. You couldn't, um, you know, take a, a company like, I don't know, uh, what's a very cyclical company? You couldn't even take like ExxonMobil or something like that and, uh, and invest in this way simply because of the cyclicality of the oil industry or a consumer goods company like Apple Computer wouldn't work, right? So they find, a, you know, maybe a, a slightly boring company that creates steady cash flows and they're able to invest. They buy out the whole firm, they lever it up, so they go to 60 to 70% or more of debt. Um, a lot of times I've seen like 75% debt. Usually these are high free cash flow generating businesses because you of course need that free cash flow in order to pay the, uh, the interest payments on the debt. Um, the leverage amplifies returns because basically, you know, the, if you borrow money to invest, if things go well, you do better than if you had not borrowed the money to invest. But equally, if things go wrong, you should lose more. So essentially, it's a riskier investment. A, a leveraged investment, one that is financed by a lot of debt, is riskier than an unleveraged investment. The real benefit or one of the real benefits in there is the tax shield on, on the interest expense. So basically a company is able to, when they pay interest on a loan, they get to write that off as an expense and therefore that reduces the taxes they have to pay on their, uh, on their income. And so this works quite well for private equity companies for, for leverage buyouts. It's, it's a big part of the reason that these things are done this way. And so here's a slide from Thompson uh, on the share of US leverage buyout market by leveraged by leverage level, so how much debt is involved. So the black area there is less than six times leverage, gray is six to seven times leverage, and red is greater than seven times leverage. So as you can see, 
in the run-up to the credit crunch, there was a big growth in the level of leverage. Um, it disappeared basically by 09. Uh, you know, it, it, the, the level of leverage uh, dampened down quite a bit. And as you can see in recent years, it's it's ramped up. It looks almost as as high as it was uh, during uh, 07, right before the credit crunch. So once again, um, we'll see how that works out. It's uh, an interesting study. The very first LBO, so where did these come from? Well, the very first example of an LBO was in 1955 when McLean bought Pan Atlantic and Waterman using $42 million of debt and $7 million of preferred shares. So they it put up $7 million, borrowed $42 million in order to do this transaction. Now, the company, Waterman, already had 20 million. So the target company, the company that was being bought out, already had a lot of cash. They had $20 million of cash. So as soon as the deal closed, they were able to use that $20 million in cash to pay off some of the loans to start with. And so this is sort of the first idea of the leveraged buyout. So this was 1955 and there were maybe more tax advantages back then than there are today a lot of loopholes have been closed but this was uh this was the very first one and actually we have um in uh in the corporate finance book there, there's a i think a, a couple of paragraphs on the topic explaining that deal tax treatment of debt so like many investment banking innovations, leverage buyouts were initially driven by tax savings and loopholes, okay? So essentially, like, why, why come up with a new way of investing in companies? And the answer is that there's a tax advantage. And that's kind of what you'll see an awful lot of in finance is whenever there's a regulatory hole or a tax advantage, people will uh, leap to, uh, to try and profit from that. And so early leverage buyouts allowed tangible asset write-ups and depreciation. So you could buy out a company, you could take all of their assets, write them up to a new high value, and then depreciate them over the next few years. And of course, that means you reduce the tax that you have to pay because of the depreciation expense, and thus you get a higher return than, than the regular investors would have gotten. Then you might sell it again five years later to another private equity firm who would write up the assets and depreciate them again. You know, So it was kind of a big tax loophole that drove a lot of these early deals. Eventually, tax authorities worked out what was going on here and they disallowed this sort of repeated depreciation of assets. So you can't do this anymore, but this was one of the early uh, angles associated with this type of deal. So the other big thing, as I mentioned earlier, is this government incentivization behind debt. And we have to always ask, you know, often things are uh, the way they are and no one really questions why that is the case. but. Governments worldwide, for some reason, incentivize debt over equity. And by that, I mean that they allow you, well, say if you buy a house, you're able to uh, to write off the interest that you're paying on your, your mortgage against your taxes. And so you're able to reduce your tax rate. Uh, similarly, for companies, they're able to expense uh, their, their uh, interest payments. And thus it means that it is cheaper to, uh, to finance a company through debt than through equity. This ties into the whole Miller Medigliani thing. If you've studied any uh, corporate finance, you know that, that essentially uh, in a world with taxes where, where debt is, uh, is incentivized through the tax code, people tend to borrow more uh, and companies tend to borrow more. And so enabling tax deductibility of debt, but not dividend payments means that it's advantageous to structure your company with as much leverage as is reasonable in order to reduce the, the taxes paid on, uh, on the income of the company. But obviously that's the way things are as to why they're that way. I can't really tell you, but that is, that's the world we live in. So um, yeah, we've got a bunch of Gordon Gecko slides now because you know if I find Gordon Gecko clip art, I'm using that. Um, so the background of LBO. So it was an obscure deal type. Although the first one occurred in 1955, 
these kind of became very big in the 1980s. And the reason for that was in the 1960s, there was this trend to build conglomerates, you know, where companies thought it was better to be diversified rather than being a company that has one product. They thought, well, investors should want to invest in a company that's in 20 different businesses. And therefore, when one is doing well, the other might not be. And we kind of smooth out our volatility through this sort of correlation effect, right? It's a diversified portfolio all in in one stock. And so in the 1960s, there was a load of M&A activity where these conglomerates were built up. And then basically people decided a lot of these conglomerates didn't perform that well. And a lot of people said, well, the problem is that it's a conglomerate and that, um, you know, essentially the, the management are trying to run seven companies in seven different industries rather than being experts in one industry. So it became a thing to break them all apart. So the early private equity companies in the 1980s had all of these big conglomerates to go to and just to buy business units out of them and then try and either turn them around or just lever them up and get a tax benefit. And so um, basically these early PE companies were able to profit from inefficient underpriced corporate assets or inefficient conglomerates. So this was sort of the start of, uh, of the boom in leveraged buyouts. And so they often bought entire companies, breaking them up, selling off pieces. Um, there's all sorts of stories. There's a book, uh, what's it called? Barbarians at the Gate is kind of a 1980s uh, investment classic on the topic of, um, of uh, leveraged buyouts. There's also the Wall Street film, uh, which I think everyone has seen. Um, there was a big media backlash against corporate raiders. That's what they called them, corporate raiders. And they said, you know, they're, they're buying out these companies and bringing about efficiencies. But the efficiencies just means firing all the staff and outsourcing and, and so on. And so people didn't like this. In fact, interestingly enough, the film Wall Street was supposed to... Um, Gordon Gecko was meant to be a villain, you know, I, f I forget the name of the guy who made the film, but he was horrified and surprised that people ended up having sympathy for Gordon Gecko because he thought he was just this awful character, you know, with his greed, his good speech and whatever. But, you know, the media really did not like what was going on with all of these LBOs in the 1980s. And, um, and that you know, to this day is kind of an issue. There's a lot of uh, backlash against private equity firms. Um, the, the, this, this deal structure did appeal a lot to often the management of some of these firms because it became an opportunity to potentially own some of the company if it was an MBO or even just you might be incentivized by equity uh, due to the private equity owners setting it up that way. And so uh, it appealed to management of these companies as well. So where do they get the financing? I've just said they, they often buy a company and then lever it up to maybe 75%. Um, there's a bunch of different sources of financing, back debt, uh, revolving credit facilities that they might have, asset-based lending, uh, leveraged loans, high yield bonds, bridge loans, and mezzanine debt. So these are the different types of debt uh, that they're able to take on or the different uh, places they can go. Um, you know, in, in the 1980s, the big thing was a high yield bonds, also known as junk bonds. And you, you can Google that term if you want to learn about it. Um, but, uh, but this is sort of where, um, where the financing comes from. And in fact, there was um, Michael Milken of, what was his firm name, Drexel? Drexel Burnham Lambert, I think was the name of his firm. He was sort of the junk bond king in the 1980s. And so he essentially was this sort of, uh, you know, he owned his own investment bank. He was uh, um, kind of a great salesman, I guess. And he went out and pitched to the world that these new, uh, what they called high yield bonds, the world started calling them junk bonds, but they, you know, he liked the term high yield bonds. Um, these bonds had good returns if you held a diversified portfolio of them because essentially a high yield bond is a lot like an equity investment, he argued. And so he took this tiny little niche market of high yield uh, loans or high yield bonds and made it quite big and sold an awful lot of them. And so that was also part of the whole boom in private equity in the 1980s.
So has the market changed at all? Well, it has, you know, and this is kind of the, the uh, one of the issues that we have to look at. One is just that the market is much more picked over. You know, the, this idea that you can find a company with stable cash flows and no debt, and, you know, that the owners or the management haven't worked out that there's a tax advantage associated with that, uh, with levering up the company. That's less the case today. Um, and in addition, there's just a ton of private equity firms out there. You know, it used to be a small business, even in the 1980s, it was a much smaller business than it is today. And, you know, when you saw back there the amount of capital allocated to it by university endowments and so on, um, you know, the problem is that there's an awful lot of money uh, chasing fewer and fewer deals. Um, also, the companies are pre-levered, and so the deal structures have had to change a lot. It's, it's maybe a more complex uh, business than it used to be, and you, you could maybe expect the returns not to be as good going forward as they used to be, but that's, uh, that's something I'll leave you to decide. Um, so how does this work or how does a, a private equity fund work is, is the next thing we'll talk about. So the LBO capital is raised from a pool of what we call qualified investors. And that's um, the same kind of people who can invest in hedge funds can invest in private equity. And they're usually either very wealthy individuals or institutional investors. So even if you own a retirement account, uh, your company might have uh, you know, allocated some of the capital into private equity, for example, or um, you know, university endowments. All of those sort of big institutional investors do invest quite a bit in private equity. And so Institutions and wealthy individuals are able to invest in, in these funds. So LBO funds are usually structured as limited partnerships. So the firm's principles will act as the general partner. So the private equity fund is the general partner and the investors are limited partners within this structure. Um, so obviously the, uh, the, your liability is limited as an investor in this, but not if you are the, the private equity sponsor. Um, the investors are endowment funds, insurance companies, pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, wealthy individuals, and so on. So that's kind of who invests and how they invest. GP, so the general partners make the investments and the LPs provide capital. Now, usually the general partner will also invest in their own deals as well. They'll put a partner equity into them. Uh, the limited partners, usually the minimum investment in most of these funds is a million dollars. And often it's a lot higher, like the very big funds wouldn't really be interested in talking to you if that's all you had to invest. There's a commitment period, which is a number of years after the, the fund is closed, where they can call on you for the capital. So you agree to provide the capital and you kind of set it aside. And then they go out and they search for deals. And when they find the deals, they do what's called a capital call. And they tell you, uh, you know, we'll say if you committed to put five million in, they say, well, we're going to call on you for one. Uh, you've got two weeks to provide that to us. And, uh, and that will be used in the first deal we'll do. And over time, they'll draw down all of the capital that you've committed to them and invested. And so then the money is invested, maybe 10 to 12 years. The first period is, of course, this commitment period. Then after that, there is just the returns period, uh, which involves managing and exiting the investments made. And uh, usually there'll be some sort of requirement of diversification or whatever within the space. So there might be an agreement to cap the maximum percentage of equity in a single investment. So they don't want, if, if an investor puts their money into a fund, they want to get uh, that capital invested in a diversified basket of deals rather than all into just one deal. Um, so that is kind of how it would work. Um, Management fees are between 0.75 and 3% of committed capital. Uh, often, the, the, basically, the fee structure is a lot like the hedge fund fee structure of 2 and 20, which means 2% of assets under management per year are paid to the, uh, to, to the fund as a fee, and then 20% of the performance. So if, if, if they double your money, they get to then keep 20% of 
the money that they made for you. Usually for private equity, there's some sort of hurdle rate in there. So they might have to get you a return that is, we'll say, greater than 5% before they start taking the 20. Um, the performance fee of 20% is earned once the manager returns all of the capital. And it's sometimes above that, that uh, hurdle rate, as I mentioned. Uh, executive and employees of the private equity firm can often invest alongside, uh, often not paying any fees or sometimes having to pay fees. Uh, but that is sort of how they make money. So they make money on the management fee, on the carried interest. And if they invest, they make the return that, uh, that their investors also make on an investment in, uh, in the deals. Um, carried interest, you know, you'll, you'll constantly hear about this in the press, um, in particular around election times, uh, because there's, there's basically a controversial tax treatment on carried interest. So the 20% the performance fee gets capital gains taxed instead of being treated as ordinary income. So it's kind of a fee-like income, but it's viewed as being a capital gain rather than, um, rather than a fee. And therefore it gets a much lower tax rate usually. In, in the U US and in the United Kingdom, there's usually a much higher tax rate for high income earners. So it's much better for you to get your, your uh, return in, uh, in, in terms of capital gain rather than, uh, than sort of an income type payment. Uh, the private equity managers get paid from carried interest which means that often for a very high earner, they might have a lower tax rate than you might expect. And the capital gains tax uh, applies also, you get a lower capital gains tax for long-term investments. These tend to be long-term investments and thus they get better treatment. Now, uh, I've always wondered, it's never made sense to me why the tax uh, uh, system incentivizes long-term rather than short-term investments. It doesn't seem uh, really very different to me, but that's the way it is set up. And so obviously this works for private equity investors. So what kind of things do, do they invest in? What's a good LBO target? So strong cash flow generation, and this is sort of the biggest thing. This is all they, well, it's not all they care about, but it's, it's a big deal to them. And that's required to repay the debt. There has to be a strong asset base as well, because you know more assets, therefore you have collateral to lever up. A low fixed costs, low capital expenditure requirement, a defensible market position. So they, they don't want the kind of uh, investment that a competitor could maybe come in and, uh, you know, um, take a huge market share and suddenly dry up all of the uh, cash flow that they need to pay off the debt. A proven management team, and they'll often, you know, get them involved in the deal one way or another. They'll, they'll uh, earn uh, more if the deal goes well. Um, there's usually relatively little existing debt because, of course, if the whole trick is to lever it up, it doesn't work if it's already levered. Now, as I've said, they're finding less and less of that type of deal nowadays. Turnaround opportunities are possibly attractive, but like I said, that's not their core business. But of course, it doesn't hurt if you can also do that. Potential for growth might be attractive, but once again, not really their core thing and attractive valuations, right? And so they are the type of things that, uh, that Gordon Gecko here, a private equity investor, might look for in a company. And if he needed a friend, a dog will do him just fine. Um, so exit strategies, how do, how do you get out of these deals? Well, they aim for like a five year or more holding period usually. And the idea is that private equity can increase equity value through operational improvements or through paying down the debt. There's a bunch of different ways that they exit these deals. One is an IPO. Now, as I've said, 
IPOs have kind of dried up. So years ago, that might have been a big thing. Nowadays, the majority of exits are through mergers and acquisitions rather than through IPOs. The next one here is sale to a strategic buyer, so a M&A type activity where they find someone who might want to buy this company or this asset. Um, sale to another private equity firm, right? You, you'd think that, that they were all done with it, but no, you know, there are private equity firms that invest in deals that other private equity firms are exiting. Um, dividend recapitalization, now that's a controversial one, and we'll come back to that in a second. And then below par debt repurchase. So in distress situations, PE firms can buy back distressed debt if the PE firm thinks that the market has mispriced it. So there's all sorts of little games they can play with their investment in this. Now, dividend recapitalization is sort of an interesting one where they issue new debt and pay shareholders dividends. And so there's a bunch of examples. If you look at um, Eddie Lampert's invest, I think his firm is called ESL or something like that. Uh, Eddie Lampert's investment in Sears and in Kmart, uh, you'll see how, how that has maybe worked out. It's quite controversial. Um, and in fact, Google it and read a bit of news if you're interested. But the idea basically is that a company is able to, um, we'll say, for example, they levered the whole thing up and then the debt has been paid down over the time of the, uh, the owning of the company, right? They paid it down quite a bit. They're then able to borrow more money and then they're able to uh, to use that ad borrowed money in order to pay a big dividend to themselves. So there's examples where uh, some of these private equity firms might have gotten three times their return out of the company, still owned their equity stake, and maybe even the equity stake isn't doing that well at that point, right? Because uh, basically all of the capital has constantly been pulled out of the, the firm. And so this is controversial because of course, once in a while, one of these things goes bankrupt, a lot of people lose their jobs. There was a kind of a famous example in, in England, I guess probably about 10 years ago with the car company Rover. Uh, it's worth looking up that story if you're interested in that sort of thing as well. And so there's a bunch of different ways they can get out. Like I said, the most basic ones are IPO and and uh, M and A activity, but there's many other ways uh, that that they're able to, uh, you know, extract cash from these deals. MBO, we'll, we'll finish up here with management buyouts then. So an, an MBO, as I mentioned earlier, is a leveraged buyout where the existing managers buy all or a large part of the company. Um, the big issue here is that the due diligence is usually more limited. And by that, I mean the buyer's due diligence because they don't have to spend as much money trying to understand the firm because they're already the managers of the firm, right? So they, they kind of know what they're buying. The seller is unlikely to give many warranties. So often when there's a deal like this, the seller might have to uh, give certain warranties within a transaction. They usually don't have to in a management buyout because they say you guys already know what's going in the firm, on in the firm. There's, no, there's nothing being hidden from you, so I'm not gonna provide any warranties associated with this deal. Uh, management buyers might have an unfair advantage in terms of their knowledge. And, and there's even issues where um, you know, the conflicts of interest within management buyouts, they loom large, you know. And so the, there's what they call a principal agent problem in finance um, and moral hazard here. So the management might be incentivized to push down the price before the purchase, right? Because if you know you're buying out the asset, maybe you highlight all of the bad news in the earnings reports and so on, which would sink the share price and then you might be able to get in at a better price. The management might do things like uh, pursue accelerated and aggressive loss recognition or publicly launch an unwise project, you know, so they say we're going to do, we're going to enter this new business that sounds like a terrible idea and that brings the stock price down. So. I'm not saying that they do this. I'm saying that there there is a risk of this. And so um, management buyouts can be controversial and they're just, there's very obvious uh, conflicts of interest. And that's even why people separate the idea of an LBO from an MBO. You could say they're the same thing. The big difference is this conflict of interest associated with the, the managers having all of this inside information. So, what do sellers do 
in order to deal with a management buyout, right? Because when the management uh, approach you uh, to say they want to buy out the company, you can't use the management to in any way help you get a good deal because they are the buyer, right? And so usually what will happen is that, um, that the owners of the company will hire an investment banker. And this is the best image of an investment banker I could get now. Of course, in real life, an investment banker would never wear a different colored uh, pants with his suit jacket. You know, this, isn't, this is his golf club look, I suppose. Um, but anyhow, um, they'd hire an investment banker to value the firm and try to ensure that the investors get a, a fair deal. Um, Another problem, though, in this deal, even though you've got your investment banker hopefully helping you out, is, um, you know, the investment bank will possibly try and pitch it to other investors, to other buyers, right? Because that, that's a way of them earning a, a good fee as well. But the problem is that a lot of other buyers won't really want to get involved because they'll realize that if they bought it, and the management didn't get to buy it, that of course the management are now working for them and are maybe unhappy with them and uh, they're, they're lacking an incentive to try very hard. So private equity exits, we've got up here, you know, a total exit, which is a trade sale, an LBO or a share repurchase. There's also a flotation or IPO. And then we've got here partial exits, which are private placement, corporate venturing and corporate restructuring. So they don't always get a full exit. They sometimes have a, pro, uh, have a partial exit and there's a little tail piece continuing on after the, uh, the fund has aimed to wrap up. Um, AUM by performance. So we see here with private equity firms that usually after good deals, they get more capital and after, after bad deals, they get less capital. So basically, the kind of people who invest in, um, in private equity tend to chase returns. And as I mentioned earlier, that seems to maybe work in the venture capital space. It's not really obvious that it works in the, uh, in the LBO space, but that's what people do. Um, what else have we got here? Uh, so in terms of returns, well, US buyout returns have converged with public equity returns over the recent cycle. So over the last 10 years, what have we got here? In gray, we've got the S&P 500, and in red, we've got US buyout funds. And so over the last 10 years, the S&P has returned 15.5%, and LBO firms have returned 15.3%, so slightly less. And to a certain extent, this is maybe to be expected, because if you think about it, what is a private equity firm? They're investing in equity, which is what the S&P is, but it's private rather than public equity. So essentially what you've got is quite a levered investment into equity, uh, which may or may not work out for you, but in, in truth, you might argue that the long-term expected return of private equity is possibly similar to public equity. But once again, I'll allow you to think about that. Now, over the longer term, you know, when we go back 30 years over here, there was significantly greater return associated with private equity. But of course, that was when it was a much smaller business. There was less money chasing the deals. And also there were maybe greater, uh, you know, tax and regulatory advantages. And so that is it with today's class, private equity. Uh, I'll be back tomorrow and the day after with two classes, both on the topic of hedge funds. And uh, I'll see you then. Bye.